Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Barzinga. Barzinga. <laughs> oh, you're a little slow, I'm... Roan. <laughs> okay, we'll try it again. Take two. Do it again, Lauren. Want to do it again? All right, let's do, do it, it again. That's fine. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Barzinga. Barzinga. <laughs> I'm Baltimore Lauren. And Chris Roan. And, and who do we have as our guest today? Today we have Mark Zaid. Esquire, Mark, guys. Hey, Mark. Welcome Glad to the party. Glad to be here. So today's guest. Well, we are back from a, uh, a relatively long-ish ish hiatus. Um, Mark, I'm very excited to have Mark on today. Mark, uh, had it on the Lauren, comic books too. <laughs> the comic books. Mark and Lauren and I, uh, we've known each other for several years through the uh, CGC message boards, through comic swaps, through comic book conventions. And uh, Mark is not only a aficionado in Golden Age and uh, platinum. What was it? Platinum, Mark, you said? Uh, es- plat- Victorian, platinum, esoteric, rare themed books. Uh, he is also a high powered DC attorney. And I am very excited to have him on. We got a lot of ground to cover today. There's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. But first, what are we drinking, kids? Go ahead, Lauren. Ladies first. All right. Oh, thank you. So, Rich. <laughs> was nice enough Shalom. thank you happy Mazel hanukkah tov. everybody mostly happy to mark because i know he celebrates um so fake dad was nice enough to save me some of this hanukkah pass the yes. beer from schmaltz brewing company it's a dark ale brewed with chocolate it's actually super yummy wow oh very nice nice i, I like it i know we had hanukkah beer see i i know we have passover beer because when yeah, i was well, when there's I was beer for everything I go to the Nationals games during Passover, and of course, we're not supposed to drink beer because it has yeast in it during Passover days. But I would always go up to the bar and uh, order my Passover beer, um, which would freak everybody out. And you'd hear you'd hear all these people, and you'd see them turn around, and go, "There's Passover beer," and <laughs> and I was I was just violating Passover and drinking beer by calling it Passover beer. It was <laughs> that makes it that makes it okay. That makes it okay. It, it, yeah, was, yeah. it was a running joke yeah. for, for a while when I knew the bartender. So I have courtesy of Rich this uh what's let's see what is this one? Out of shape superhero of Fat Thor. Yes, that's <laughs> awesome. I, I love Mark enjoy. Mark hold that can up a little closer to the camera. So rotate it just yes. the other way. There you go. Right there. Yes, that's Fat awesome. Thor on the couch with his hand in his pants. How can you not that that beer just speaks volumes to 2020? Absolutely. <laughs> I am an IPA drinker, so thank you, Rich. You're very welcome. It's uh it's actually one of my favorites from a local brewery out here in Columbia, Maryland, uh Black Flag Brewing. Um, every now and then they do these unique can drops where you have to go to the brewery to retrieve it. They don't distribute those to any of the vendors. So that happened to be one of those uh unique limited uh beers. Um, I think they might be down in the last two cases, Lauren. We might need to make a beer run after the show. Yeah, I think you said there were like three or four left. So yeah. I fully expect us to go to Black Flag when we leave here. So. <laughs> as long as you're driving, <laughs> I don't expect oh, to be. <laughs> don't, no, no, we're not going anywhere then. We are getting top news and staying. We're getting uh, Roan, what do you got in your cup? Well, I love to support my local breweries. So I'm drinking this Hus Brewing from here in Tempe, Arizona. See if it kind mm. of. Uh, like looks like the maybe a little out of focus but it's a it's a coffee kolsch beer it's got coffee in it um but it's uh but it pairs nicely with smoked meats wild game lamb chops soft cheeses um and uh in brie so yeah so it's a it's a pretty good beer and i'm gonna pour it my and one of my favorite mugs here my my rogue one alamo draft house limited edition uh beer glass so oh very nice i should have grabbed my obi-wan beer mug that you sent me for christmas a couple of years ago oh yeah can i just can uh, i interject real fast please um this hanukkah beer i just read the side of it, it starts with come on bubby light my fire <laughs> <laughs> and ends with no guilt no glory <laughs> that's awesome that's fantastic. And what do you drink, Rich? That's my next tattoo. Well, I have a few different selections here because I wasn't sure, A, how long we were going to last, <laughs> B, how many different beers we we're going to talk about. <laughs> but I'll preface by saying, so Lauren and I have spent uh, the latter part of these last few months um, touring a lot of the local breweries in the area. We've gone to Hysteria 
and Black Flag, both in Columbia. We spent a lot of time in Nepenthe. Oh, uh, yeah. Out in Baltimore. Yeah, you guys have been all over the place. There's actually, I discovered another brewery about 15, 20 minutes from my house going towards Rich. So Mm -hmm. that was, I sent you the link the other day, but I think that should be our next stop. And I know DC and Northern Virginia have a bunch of great breweries and distilleries as well. Oh, for sure. Well, I would definitely like to, actually, this is kind of where I'm heading in this direction. I would very much like to go to Adroit Theory. Um, A lot of my recent favorite beers have been coming from Adroit Theory. Uh, Is that image reversed on your end too, like it is on mine? No, I can see it. Oh, good. So it's Elegy uh, featuring... I mean, I got too much light here, but that's a Brendan Lee Crow. Yes, some Crow. You that's got there. Awesome. So they do they do a series of these things. If I tip this light just a little bit, it won't look as weird. This is the new one. This was limited to six thousand cans. Actually, the cans are signed are numbered. They're not. I almost said signed and numbered. <laughs> They're numbered. This was the one that they released uh, a few weeks back. They're uh, hazy IPAs. Uh, this one is pain edition. This one is ghost edition. Uh, I, the only place that carries these, unfortunately in the area and Lauren, you're probably familiar with the perfect pour, um, just on the opposite side of Columbia, the brewery is in DC, but unless you're going to the brewery, I mean, there's like no other vendors that carry this beer and I have no idea why. Honestly, I would love to go down to DC just for the day. I mean, obviously we're like in the middle of COVID, but we can get space suits like, from Ed. Ed will loan us his space suits okay, and we can, fine. All right, we cool. can do that. Yeah, that's cool. We can totally. So, I do, so that's I what do, I got. I do miss living in Virginia and driving up to Georgetown and hanging out in D.C. Oh. and just, you know, just bar hopping and, yeah, you know, taking the train up to yeah. New York. Oh, oh Lauren, I, I got that. my uh, Nepenthe. What did you do, Ray Glass? Oh, oh look at that. What you gave me your you? Oscar's Ale House glass, so uh, thanks, actually, buddy. You know, I I have behind me uh, all of uh, Paul's glasses. Um, what was Paul's? Oh, name? Tomb Tumbler. Uh, Tomb Tumbler. So Tomb I have Tumbler, a whole yeah. bunch of Tomb Tumblers behind me. So let's see. Um, grab one of your Tomb Tumblers. I, I will grab my Invaders. Oh, oh look at that! Actually. Very nice. That's nice. That's pretty cool, man. Look at that. It is filthy. Uh, well, who cares? <laughs> this is what I love about the uh, our uh, doing this. We all just nerd out, show our shit off, like you know, you grab shit off the shelf. I mean, this I wish is what I, I love about this. Grab no, my tune. No, my tune tumblers are on the bar behind Lauren. Lauren is actually in my house in the basement on the other side, <laughs> sitting adjacent yeah. to my bar, where all my tune yeah. tumblers are. <laughs> all of my, all of my nerd stuff is at home, or I just finished paying it off and I'm waiting for it to be sent to me. So that's where all of my nerd stuff is. Nice. So I actually so, just got back into buying and collecting comic books after a multi-year hiatus. Yeah. And thanks to Rich pointing me in the right direction of certain books, I have an 8.0 Moon Knight coming my way, I think, next week. Now, would that be the, the first Moon Knight? Werewolf by, Werewolf by, by Night 32. 32. Werewolf by Night 32. I'm excited nice. about that. Very and, nice. Uh, well, I can show something off here. Since I'm actually within reaching distance, I have to, I have to get up. <laughs> and grab it but this is actually kind of cool since you're speaking of first moon night hold on one second <clears throat> yeah the uh um in fact i have a moon night i just bought one when they announced the moon night series yeah I that's why moon. i bought it yeah so i did the same thing i just i'm, re- I'm getting ready to, to list this house after i pretty much have all the remodeling done so i'm getting ready to like box up all my collectibles and put it in storage before i go buy the next one so I had to put all of my collectibles in storage because my apartment isn't big enough for all of my shit. Oh, geez. Yeah. So. A couple different storage units. So um, Lauren and I are actually uh, friends with Doug Mensch, who created Moon Knight, as you know. And um, right before COVID, I could tell you it was almost exactly a year ago, I started working with Doug, helping to um, get all of his personal collection together for resale and whatnot. And one of the books, one of one, few of the books he had from his personal collection his file copy werewolf by night 32 first appearance of moon night uh signed by doug and if you can see the label actually if i can move the center here the label actually says from the collection of doug mensch oh yeah look at that oh, that's cool yeah and it's a nine two it it had the potential to be a little higher in grade if not for i think it had just a couple faint stress marks on the front of the spine 
And then there's a 7.5 that unfortunately got 7.5 because of a couple stains on the back cover. And that unfortunately was due to um, storage conditions. What do you think it should go for? The 9.2? Uh, I think Doug wants me to wait until like the show launches. Um, I don't yeah, know. I think, could be I think it should guest. be right before the show because uh, yeah. I mean, all of us yeah, have it, been it, around the block on these books. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, you remember, remember when um, Watchmen? Everybody was like paying stupid money for the complete set. Yep. Or and then the movie. Know. Yeah, the movie like know. we've all <laughs> we've all been around enough to know. I actually so like the before. movie. I, I genuinely like the movie, although. That being said, the HBO series that came out, I thought was the perfect love letter to the original series. I so thought it was fantastic. My senior thesis to graduate college was on Watchmen. And I, thanks. That's so sweet of you. My sister tells me I'm old, but everybody else tells me I'm so young. So anyway, I got an A on the paper and I graduated college. It was great. Um, but I interviewed Jeffrey D. Morgan like years later. Shut your mouth. Are yeah. you serious? That's With, awesome. Um, Norman Reedus was there too. And I was supposed to interview both of them, but I mean, I like Norman Reedus. Like I like Boondock Saints. I like the Lady Gaga video he did. But the whole time I was like, so I just kept talking to Jeffrey D. Morgan because he's, he's such an interesting person. And I honestly loved his portrayal of the comedian. I thought if the movie just focused oh, on the comedian, it would have been perfect. Mm, right, it was right. fantastic. So totally agree he was great in that Spy character Rashman, sorry i I, th I think he actually makes a good negan i, th I think he he makes a good everything he, he, yes he does but the interesting thing about his portrayal as negan is he actually has found a way to make that <laughs> particular um um unredeemable character redeemable you know this mm -hmm. whole last arc with the whispers has been really also more about negan's redemption I haven't no. seen any of the last two seasons. I've quit after, um, what was it? Season six, I think it was. So I've been. I saw I've the first like, episode. Really? <laughs> That's all I've seen. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I actually like this last season. This this arc with the whispers, I thought was was fantastic. Mark, you know what know did? You... you know what was good though? The Walking Dead pinball machine. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you're not into Walking Dead? Not watching it, or? I have never watched walking dead and i'm not as you know i saw the original zombie stuff you know back in the 60s late 60s um but never never been into the zombie stuff i see you know i don't know if, if uh rich and lauren have you ever gone up to the mid-atlantic nostalgia convention because uh, yeah. yes yes i have that's so up I in hunt valley right yep. Sun, yeah hunt valley, yeah, valley. Maryland, just north of baltimore i would go up there every every year it usually was in august or september it is, it is a great, I love this stuff. It's, it's television and movie stars from the 50s, 60s, and 70s predominantly with, with some mattering into newer stuff. So the one guy who was always there is one of the Walking Dead guys. I forget. If you said his name, I might, I might recognize it. But there's a young, mm. he's a young guy. He's there. a young guy with blonde hair and he wears a hat. And he's like super yeah. thin. Yeah. Yeah, so I know every, I know one him. One of the regular guys people. who's there every every year. He does a lot of like little shows like that convention because um, I knew him through a bunch of mutual people. So, but I, I I've only seen one episode of The Walking Dead, so that's as far as I go with it. Oh. I've played the pinball machine, and that's really all you'd have to do because <laughs> it's pinball. actually good. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, too, Mark, because I'm not I wasn't really into the zombie stuff you know growing up and all that uh you know obviously the horror flicks scary movies but then i remember when i saw the first couple episodes of walking dead i'm like whoa okay this is kind of they make it seem believable like it's not corny and cheesy and then you know just the the visual aspects of how they made the zombies come to life and made it feel realistic that's what got me hooked into it i was like okay i can watch this it's not star wars mm -hmm. i, I can also watch start to make decisions when certain programs like i i never have never seen game of thrones Mm. That's not worth it. So, or um, what was the Kevin Spacey before House, House of Cards downhill scandal wise? House of Cards. House, House of Cards. cards which yeah. I would probably love. Do you, you would love, love House of Cards? It's all about DC stuff. You yeah. love it, and I'll probably yeah. watch it at some point. But the reason why all of these programs I didn't watch is because they were very successful and have 
dozens and dozens and dozens of episodes <clears throat> and I don't have the time Yeah, yeah. To, get, to get, I mean, now with COVID you binge everything. So maybe I would have the time, but yeah. you know, I didn't want to watch any of those and go, Oh my God, I actually like this and then get stuck having to watch every single one of them. And you will with house of cards. Trust me. I, I yeah. no doubt, he's yeah. a, he's a goddamn genius dude. When it comes to that movie, get put all this crazy weird shit, personal life aside. He made that character, man. I'm telling oh, yeah. you. It's, it was, and it, it's another one of those shows that I, I genuinely enjoyed, genuinely look forward to. I still haven't finished it, and I don't know so if, you know, I I stopped watching it right before the scandal, um, and I, it's one of those things I keep meaning to get back to, much like Mad Men. I keep meaning to get back to it. The problem is, as Mark said, there, wait, there's so wait, much wait, 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 wait. You haven't finished Mad Men. I haven't finished either. I'm about to bust through that wall next to you to yell at you. Like you haven't finished Mad Men. I will. I will. I promise. I promise. Lord, I'm on the, the second episode. Show. There's That's a lot it. to do. I also haven't gotten started the wire yet. I got you know I, so much. What? Things. I know. I know. I Stop it. Stop it. I know. I know. But here's the th here's the funny thing. Lauren knows this, and I think Chris knows this. Mark, you because we haven't spoken in a while, but um, I had a friend or have a friend who works in a lot of television and movie production in the DC Baltimore area. And one of the shows that he was on was house of cards and about, I don't know, eight months before the scandal, it was right as they had wrapped up that prior season. And we had talked about him bringing me on set. Uh, and we were going to meet the cast. I was probably going to get some, maybe some stuff signed by Kevin Spacey. It was supposed to be a whole thing. And he said, yeah, well, as soon as we, you know, get into the, they start production on the new season, usually in the fall, a couple of weeks in, yeah, we'll, we'll have you out. So they started production. And I remember it was exactly the second week of production. And I went into um, my local restaurant where my friend's wife works. And it was the day the news broke about Spacey. The day it broke and uh, we had hooked up to discuss, you know, when I was going to go on set, he says, well, he goes, <laughs> I'm not I'm not really sure. But here's what I, th you know, Kevin didn't come on set today. He'll probably show up tomorrow. The next day, his hat in his hands, apologize. And, you know, it'll all blow over. And then it didn't blow over. And then <sighs> and then it got, as you know, <laughs> a lot more it's a serious shame. he was he was in yeah. one of my favorite movies and now i just feel weird watching it i yeah i'm not sure how i feel because i genuinely liked kevin spacey as an actor and i can appreciate what he brings to each performance he's a fantastic actor but dude what the fuck are you thinking yeah i still like k-pack i watch it every time i see it oh yeah, god my, i haven't seen that in a long time mine's the usual suspects that's like my all-time favorite one of his agreed kaiser's kaiser soze Agreed. Agreed. So, so good. So, guys, moving along, let's uh, I, I want to start off by talking about Mark's uh, appreciation for the Golden Age comics. Lauren, I know you and Mark can definitely connect because that's your wheelhouse as well. But the one thing that I wasn't aware of was what you said, Victorian Age comics, Mark. So let me start yeah, there I mean, for a second, if I could. Victor you know, Platinum is more well known for us than Victorian because right. Victorian is not they're not really comic books it, no they're more they're more like because i collect the victorian age and platinum age as well um but i think you do that so it's really more they're like political cartoons yeah much more so you don't really see the comic evolve until the platinum age when you have foxy grandpa or the yellow yeah. kid or even at some point the brownies i think turn into more yeah i mean the brownies i have a whole bunch of those like I brought, ah, what do i got you know, bringing up father, that would be yeah. platinum age. Oh, uh, wow. This is a good example of platinum so, age. So I did not know bringing up father wow. platinum age. I used to read the Sunday comic of bringing up father oh. when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah. There's a lot of well, modern age. comics that technically started in the platinum age. Like, Other than um, the person who colored in this one. But. Oh, yeah. 1923. Wow. Yeah. So, well, for the, for the for the kids and the listeners and readers at home, like one, Rich, why don't you give them like a little synopsis of like the the different you know areas of comics and how they get you know labeled platinum or modern or you know classic and silver age and all that. Well, Mark, I'll let you field that question because Victorian and platinum is definitely not my wheelhouse. Yeah. You know, Vic Victorian. I mean, not these these ages are very fluid. 
uh, for the most part, you know, by say a, a decade or so, uh, other than some specific events. Um, I mean, platinum is, is at least for way I would look at it is early 19, early 20th century, I should say, um, with maybe like um, starting more with, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh my God, Buster Brown. Uh, those type of books, uh, which are phenomenal. I didn't bring uh, one down here, but th these Buster Brown comic books from 1903 to about 1910 or 12, they, they got to be, yeah, at least, uh, what is that? One foot, two, like three feet long, two to three feet long, uh, maybe about two feet wide. The, the humor, none of us would get. Uh, it's it's lost. It's just first of all, it's so intellectual. I don't know how kids were reading this. I read it now today. I don't understand what the heck they're talking about <laughs> at all. Uh, it's phenomenal. But these they're just amazing books, and there's very few that exist. The the bringing up father, which are in the more in the 1920s, are more of what we start to see as platinum. Victorian is basically any time before that, basically 1830s to you know 1900 1910 golden age everybody says 1938 superman action one yep. uh, basically uh it can vary as to when golden age turns to, to silver age some people say atomic age or Ad atom age i've never heard late. those phrases before yeah really, late, really? Late atomic. Not, yeah no i've never, never heard, heard of atomic either. age no yeah some people will say it you know late 40s after the atomic bomb obviously oh. uh, there's a lot of those a lot of those like pre-code horror sci-fi books yeah. a lot of people point to as like the atomic age hmm. silver age is generally looked at as like showcase for the new flash second generation flash 1956 um then uh, bronze age what like 70 three 72 73 74 70 yeah yeah Something early like early 70s and early there are 70s. i i guess there's some there's stuff that comes after bronze age but this shows my age so I, uh, so really after after bronze age so so my <laughs> my my um understanding of the the different eras and and again starting with golden age uh you know gold silver bronze copper modern modern i believe so cgc looks at modern as anything from 1976 forward i think technically modern though according to overstreet is anything from 1985 forward oddly enough i'd like to know what comes next what's what's when does modern become zinc i don't know and then there's something you know they'll probably just but, shift the scale and move mo what was like 84 to 2000 maybe they maybe move it to some other genre and then call everything modern after 2004 probably so i think there was talk of presenting another era mm -hmm. recently and they were looking to start it around like the early 2000s but hmm. i don't know if anything came from that now would that be to say that anything from the early 2000s to current would be the new modern and then before That's that right. would possibly be yeah yeah probably yeah you know, yeah. I mean, look, you know, if you want to be somebody significant, just write an article and say, this is what the new eras are. Thanks, because I need to know what my next Overstreet article is going to be. So that, that's what's yeah. going to be now. Lauren, <laughs> I'm, I'm Lauren, tweeting when, it right now. I'm tweeting it right now, Mark. I'm going to tweet Lauren, it make, right make me, you got to get me in. Make make me, get me to be the, uh, I want to be the Overstreet, Overstreet advisor. advisor. Apparently, so, I'm like the gatekeeper now. You are the gatekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I, right. I've been an advisor since 2006, but I have not contributed for a few years, which is my bad. I need to. Uh, we, we, we have mutual friends who will go unnamed. For this show, we this the their heads will explode the day I become a Overstreet advisor, and, so, and our, that's our goal just to watch that happen. I so, became an Overstreet advisor because that same person told me I cursed too much, so I would never be one. And I was like, "Now, nah, oh fuck you, I'm going to do it." If that's not the pot, <laughs> if that's not the pot, calling the kettle black. Yeah. You know Am I right? I've been an Overstreet advisor for like five years now, so yeah, follow your dreams, kids. That's follow right. your okay. dreams. So, so Mark, what, what got you uh, into comics? I mean, does this go all the way back as a kid? Like, take us back to, take us down memory lane and like what you got in, into the Victorian and all these early comics. Yeah, I mean, I, I got into comics like I'm sure the three of you guys did and most of us, you know, reading as a kid. Uh, I, I, my earliest memories are probably when I'm about six or seven. 
Uh, I, I, and I can, so dated, I, I remember buying comics when they were 20 cents on the rack, which would be consistent with when I was six or seven, 73, 74. Yep. Sure. Like that. Uh, I collected big time for then through high school. I, I actually started, uh, I was a, a, a friend of mine, a high school classmate in mine. We, we created a and M comics. It was a reef and mark comics and we oh. sold on long island uh at uh, every month at a show our senior year of high school we had biz i still have some of the business cards oh that's cool where- that's freaking awesome yeah that's awesome mark and uh then you know went to college uh didn't do much uh during college quite frankly um sold at one show when i was in law school uh, and then was pretty much out of comics for all of the 90s other than buying an overstreet guide every so often and you know, taking it through the collection and just seeing where things had gone, showing up at a show or a, a store. Uh, Steve Jeppy, who at least, at least I don't know if Chris knows, but certainly Lauren and Rich know. Yep. Um, Steve Jeppy had a whole string of comic book stores, mm-hmm. one in Crystal City, Virginia, which maybe, Chris, you, you might yep. remember. When yep, I remember there. that. Uh, and I lived in Crystal City uh, in the suburbs of D.C. Uh, so I used to go there. Al Stoltz, I think, used to work at that store he, uh no oh, he wow. worked he worked at the uh marketplace mall okay Mar- not market is it was a marketplace mall whatever right the one at the inner harbor inner harbor there. mall um and i'm not he sure worked there with that. our other friend vince sneed he used to work the jeppy store at the mall then uh i we settled the pan am 103 lockerbie case which was the bombing of pan am 103 december yep. of 1988 i i lost people i knew who were on board the flight uh, happened when I was a senior in college. I, I had just come back from London for my semester abroad in the, in the fall, I'm sorry, in the spring semester of that year, the students who were killed were on their semester abroad fall semester mm-hmm. of the same year. And there were a lot of people, I grew up on Long Island, a lot of people from the New York City, Long Island area. And I was very focused on going after terrorists. So I sued Libya in 1993, first uh, lawsuit against them for the bombing or it, uh, and we settled it 10 years later. And I, you know, I made some money, uh, not enough to retire, unfortunately, but enough uh, as a young, you know, 30 something year old lawyer yeah. uh, to basically get me back into comic books. Oh, wow. Uh, because now I had money where I could buy the comic That was your springboard. Your that lawsuit springboard became your springboard. Back That's in. great. And, and so I created Esquire <clears throat> Comics. Uh, which has now existed since, I don't know, the end of 03, beginning of 04, something like that. Um, I, I would say go to the website, but you shouldn't go to the website because the website, I'm locked out of the website and I haven't updated it in like mm-hmm. eight or nine years. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I get messages all the time. Is this still for sale? Because the prices are like, you know, a decade old. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. no, nope, long gone, long gone, long gone. Sorry. Sorry, uh, but I will lose you lose my New Year's resolution for 2020. What year are we going into 2021? 2021. 2021. <laughs> will be gut the Esquire comics dot com website start over. Um, so I got back into it. Um, you know, I had no idea what CGC was when I came back into it. CGC had been created, what, in 2000, I think, when it opened. I came back in in 03. Not a clue about any of that. Uh fell into it really quickly, uh, met Rich and Lauren on the CGC message boards, uh, became a, a pain in the ass to CGC for quite a while uh, <laughs> until they wisely decided to hire me as their lawyer. So I've not <laughs> been their lawyer for the last seven years. Uh, so uh, I still, I will still, will, I will hold their feet to the fire when I think there's something they need to change. Uh, but it's a fantastic company. The guys are just amazing. Uh, who run it, who own it. It's a fellow Long Islander, uh, actually, who owns it. Uh, and I started to write for the guide. So I'm, an, as I said, I'm an Overstreet advisor since 06, uh, became pretty outspoken. And my collection area um, was, you know, most of us, we kind of go back to what we remember as kids, but from, I wanted to do investment quality comics. And Uh, I was frankly too concerned about the comics that I grew up or wanted as a kid. Like, you know, I wanted AF-15, I wanted Spider-Man 1, you know, all Tales of Suspense 39, 
but the fluctuation still today, I mean, I, I buy them, I'll sell them, but the fluctuation of price is so great because of how many copies are out there and, you know, a new nine, nine shows up or something like that, that I don't, I, I just, I don't like it. Uh, and my dad's a used car dealer. I'm not. Uh, and I hate the haggling buying, selling stuff. So yep. my collecting area is predominantly rare and esoteric books. Uh, ones that if I show you them and I have some, I can show that you will never have seen them or you might've heard of them, but it's the only copy that exists, you know, or maybe there's two or three copies that exist. Mark, do you happen to have anything like that with you you can show us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I go by themes as well. So as a lawyer, uh, I love legal related themes. So I buy books that have legal related um, oh, like yeah. covers and stuff. So I, and I've, I've spoken at Yale, yeah. a bunch of law schools, Yale Law School, uh, it's online actually. So this is Action 263, which is probably 19, 10 cents, uh, 1961, 60, 61, something like that. And it's uh, Superman on trial on a bizarro planet, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, you know, ones that are are obvious, like, you know, Mr. District Attorney, <laughs> you know, that was in the, the 50s, 40s to 50s. This is for 1949. Legal related stuff. Uh, like here's a congressional hearing from 1955 discussing whether or not comic books should basically be banned. Hmm. Uh, wow. Look at that, called, dude. Frederick Wortham, Dr. Wortham, seduction of the innocent, things like that. Um, got into all these rare anti-commie books. Rich and I were talking about this last night. So, Oh yeah. Uh, Blood is the harvest. Yep. 1950s anti-commie book. That, now, Mark, is that currently the highest graded copy of Blood is the Harvest? Oh, no. God, there's a 9.8 on eBay right now. Oh, wow. For like $10,000. Jesus. Huh. Uh, I don't know where that one came from. This, there was like a 9.4. This is one of the highest grade. What's hmm. that one again? 9.6? This is a 9.2. 9.2? So for the longest time when you <clears> looked <throat> in the guide, and this is where... Uh, I, I started to learn how the guide was wrong about certain things. <laughs> uh, Bob Overstreet is an awesome guy in, in having created the guide. Um, it used to say there's only 11 copies of, of this book yeah. that existed. <clears throat> uh, and then since I own about six of them, uh, there's uh, definitely not only 11 of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it, I think currently it says there's like 21 of them. And I will tell you there's more than 21 of them. And there's well, not a ton of them. That's well, you know, last night, Mark and I, we were talking about that specific book. And I, I remember learning about that book through Mark at one of our get togethers <clears throat> and looking it up. I researched and at the time. And this is I mean, I'm going back like 12 years now. Yeah. Easy. At the time, there were, quote, 12 known copies to exist. Yeah. And I found the 13th. I found it at a shop in um, uh, outside of Gaithersburg there was a copy and I honestly don't even remember what the, what grade I got on anymore, but I was so excited because I was like, Oh my God, I found the 13th copy of this book. And now, as you said, there have been so many more copies since that have come to come to yeah, market. I mean, there's who knows how many, I mean, there's probably a few dozen out there. I mean, still mm -hmm. it's a rare book. Um, yeah, obviously, but it's a, it's a niche market for it, obviously. As oh well. yeah. Uh, now, who it, wants, but I love the anti commie stuff. So, like this is a rare one. Um, I have two or three copies, but I've only probably seen four or five copies to ever exist. Oh, oh wow! 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 I'm not even sure. I keep trying to get it to go in the guide, but I'm not even sure they put it in the guide yet. Um, and this, what's great about this book? So the history of this from 1951. Uh, it's funnier than hell uh, as far as the storyline because it it's sort of like if you remember. I don't know, at least from a historical standpoint, ducking cover. Yeah. Um, oh, sure, sure. And everything like that. And, and I remember doing that in the early 70s in elementary school. We and, didn't do that. That's funny. I thought yeah, that was something that was like strictly 1950s. Well, it was, it was more for them bomb scares by that time. Yeah, but yeah. It's like you, you know, you would go and put your head against the cement wall because if that fell on you, somehow it wouldn't kill you. Uh, but in this book, it's great. It, it says, first of all, it's got a, there's two frames in particular. 
uh, a woman, and this is because this is 1950, 51. So she's in an apron and in her kitchen, and it says, unplug all the electronic appliances. So oh, my. Unplugging the toaster. Hmm. And then if you've ever seen, I think it's a South Park episode uh, when they're uh, South Park or somewhere. No, no, I'm sorry. South, yeah, South Park. They're at like a volcano or something, and they hide under newspapers, and the lava, of course, goes over them and kills them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what they say in this. They say, jump in a ditch and put newspapers over you if the atomic bomb goes off. You know what? It, it gives you it gives you something to do. It keeps you busy. Your mind occupied right before the end. O only Steven Spielberg had it right. Right. Get in a mm. lead lined refrigerator like Indiana Jones and you'll be good safe. luck finding one. But so yeah. good luck finding one. was created by commercial comics, which uh, was Malcolm Alter uh, and a very famous but not well known uh, comic book creator for promotional comics. And he worked, he had this comic book business for 40 years where he was doing pretty much all the promotional books without being credited. His son uh, sells them on eBay every once in a while. His, his, his father died a bunch of years ago. But it, um, if you remember, there's a book about Granada uh, from the invasion of Granada in 1983. Um, he created that supposedly for the CIA. Uh, and just many of the political commercial books um, were created in his office in D.C. throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, and it's great stuff. In this book, apparently, um, we don't know the history of it. This one is from Ohio, actually, because on the back, you can uh, you can see it right off oh, yeah, of the Ohio. state of yeah. Ohio. This would be blank. And then the state or whoever bought it uh, commercially could fill that in. But apparently it became an insert into the Washington Post, which I've never seen as a you know co kind of comic strip. Uh, but I, I don't I've seen less than seven, eight copies of this book. Uh, how many how many how many comics do you think you own in your whole collection? You know, I've sold off a ton. Uh, you Did know, you? I, had, I had. You know, 30 long boxes, that, you know, thousands and thousands that were from my childhood, which like all of us who grew up at that time, these books who are worthless for the most oh, part, yeah. uh, you know, cause we all collected them. We all saved them. Yep. And I mean, some of them are worth more now, right? We talked about moon Knight. I remember buying all the moon Knight books back at the time and like a rock. buck. nobody <laughs> cared about any of those books. Right. Those, mm -hmm. those were dregs, you know, <clears throat> when I would sell at shows in 84 and 85. Nobody was buying moon Knight. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, but I, now I have really, I focus on, on specific books. So I, I don't have just like, you know, huge, huge collections. I have a lot of memorabilia connected to comics and a lot of very uh, significant books. So like you can over, let's see, which shoulder, you know, on the back, you can see on the floor where it says, uh, first, first edition, back, first edition. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I can't do it right right there. Yeah, the Star Trek uh, thing. Right. So un underneath Morgan Fairchild, who got it. I, I see that, it. That's a signed photo from Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention. That's uh, awesome. she, she's a friend of mine. So uh, she, she gave that to me, which was great. Um, I used to that, work with a guy that was convinced Morgan Fairchild was stalking him. True story. <laughs> I would, I that would be an awesome stalker. Yeah, right. Imagine a worse <laughs> stalker than that. Or, but he was her. he was convinced he'd come into work he found a found a blonde hair on his pillow bring it morgan fairchild and not only that but the fbi wanted his dog his dog had government secrets and they he was convinced that they were going to plant a chip in the dog's head oh, God. oh yeah this is like that contacting me to represent them all the time oh my gosh <laughs> oh my God. reached out so that's so edition if you guys remember well again lauren's too young to remember this but the rest of us, she's probably seen them. She probably has some first edition, right? Those were huge in the 70s, those oversized books yep. that DC made. But they're that so difficult to store, am I right? I mean, how do you really yeah, I mean, store those? Yeah, so you don't see, I mean, they're not, you know, some of them, the Muhammad, Superman versus Muhammad Ali uh, can be worth $100, $200, uh, Superman, Spider-Man. Um, the Rudolph one, I think, is actually 
uh, generally well sought after, but you can generally pick them up still for like twenty, thirty dollars. Yeah, I see them all the time in um, antique stores, actually. Yeah, they're, they're those you you tend to see. So that's the first new first edition in, since the late seventies, and what wow. it is is of new fun comics, which was the first DC comic book made in nineteen thirty five, and this is the actual. Uh, copy there's very few of these that exist because you can see you know compared to me how how big they That's are huge and and this was uh so malcolm neeler wickelson nicholson uh, malcolm wheeler nicholson was the owner of dc at the time national periodical uh his his granddaughter helped get that book the the new one published uh and because it's new fun so all of these other books prior to that, like the Bringing Up Father, these are all newspaper strip reprints. Okay. That's what all of these were back at the time. And the first modern comic book um, was 1933. And the one, like if I, I, I have it, I don't have it in front of me here, but um, that book, which was done by so I give lectures on this all the time and I'm blanking on my names. Uh, what's his name from uh, EC? EC's his dad, Gaines. Yeah. Max Gaines uh, was a promotional salesman, magazine distributor. And they created this promotional book. It looks just like a regular comic book, modern comic book, right? Because right, this doesn't look like a modern comic book, uh, but a regular comic book. He, um, it was for a product, uh, a detergent product, as I recall. Uh, and uh, it was, if you bought the detergent, you'd get a free comic book if you mailed in a coupon. And he had the idea of putting a 10 cent sticker on it. And in New York City, gave a bunch of copies to a newsstand on a Friday, came back on a Monday and they're all gone. Wow. All sold. Comic book industry has now been created. But for the first two years, it was all newspaper strips. So New Fun is the first new comics. All of this is all new content. And again, uh, I mean, it's it, this is too valuable to frankly read. Uh, hmm. for the what, most what would you part. say? Put, put a dollar amount on that if you could. Well, d d two two part question: dollar amount and grade. I know we can't yeah, grade it, but uh, what do you think uh, you're looking at there? You know, I'm trying to remember if this one is restored or not. I can see it's, it's taped up. I don't think this one is restored. I mean, most, there's six issues of new fun comics, and then it becomes more fun comics uh, in issue number seven and a normal sized regular comic book. And it goes from till uh, issue 127. This, the, the thing about these books, I, this is probably like a, a very good, I imagine, which is you generally don't find new fun one through six above very good. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll find a fine minus or a fine. I don't know if there's any issues above a fine. And, you know, if you went on Heritage and you looked up at Heritage, another client of mine, Auction House, uh, and you went and looked this up, there's probably been maybe four or five copies that they've sold in 20 years. And, and it could be that one or two of those are the same copy that have come up. I mean, mm -hmm. there are, I don't know if I could put in, I'll, I'll, the only thing I could say in the, what now, 18 years that I've been back in the hobby and going after these types of books, I have probably seen less than half a dozen of these sold. And, and I, I mean, I, you know, I, I monitor all the major auctions, go to all the, used to go all the major shows. You wouldn't see this at a show. Um, because it's too it takes up too much space, and uh, I mean it's like a I mean it's not you know it's a five six thousand dollar book seven thousand dollar book five to five to eight thousand dollar book which is you know certainly is a lot of money to most people not a lot of money when you think how much you know a Spider Man number one and AF fifteen would go for but it's a very small audience uh, and again. It's the rarity of this that attracts me. You, you will not be able to find, if you want this book, you're going to have to wait till I sell this book. Wow. <laughs> you're not going to find another copy. I was actually going to ask you like what attract, because I know why I collect platinum and Victorian age books, 
but I was going to ask, why do you collect it? But obviously it's because of the scarcity. I love, I love the history and the scarcity. I, I don't read it. If you read, if you would look at this and you, and you read the story, you're like, what the hell are they talking about? I mean, I, I look at a lot of my Yellow Kid stuff and I'm just like, I don't understand what's going on, yeah. but it's cool. I actually like Yellow Kid because I really enjoyed the artwork. I, I, you're right. I can't understand it, but I, I enjoy the the imagery of Yellow Kid. Now, all yeah. that Yellow Kid Brownie. So I have, let's see, behind me, you've got uh, animation art from uh, the Gumps from uh, 1922, 23. Wow. This, this is uh, bringing up Father, as I, I think, if I remember. Original art. Original art. Uh, 1928, and uh, there's some brownies, original brownies. That's uh, cool. You know, wow, doll toys, whatever. And Did you have to steal those from the Jeppy Museum? <laughs> no, you know, I, I I own a bunch of stuff that used to be in the Jeppy Museum. Did you, okay, because, because Steve auctioned it. Actually, this used to be in the Jeppy's Museum. What what is that you got there? All right, action so number this, one. This is is it one really? One. This no. is action number two. Oh wow. Oh, wow, look at that. I don't think I've ever seen one. But the so right at Superman is on cover of Action One and then not till Action Seven. Mm -hmm. So two through six are non-Superman covers. But what is significant about this, you can see it right here. Is the stamp of the US District Court. Yeah. That <laughs> that's right so, up your alley. Huh. This book, when Superman came out in March of 38 and was a success by issue number two, because obviously they got to wait a month or two to figure out you know, how many copies sold, and was a big success. Everybody wanted to copy it. This was the first superhero. You know, I mean, there were some other people before that you could argue whether they were superheroes, but this was the first real you know, science fiction superhero. And um, this guy, Fox, who had an office in the same building as DC, created uh, Wonder Man. Wonder Man existed for one issue because as soon as he came out and he was very similar to Superman. Uh, remember, Superman did not fly when he first came out. He was right tall. He could, he, leap, he, he could jump. He tall buildings in a single yeah. bound because he wasn't flying. He was literally jumping. And Wonder Man, the cover of it is Wonder Man like jumping from building to building. Uh, and as soon as that came out, DC sued Fox. And this is one of the books that was the exhibit copy for the court case, uh, the trademark court case. Mm. Uh, sorry, the copyright, not trademark. The copyright. Yeah, DC, DC later on wound up suing um, Fawcett over um, Captain Marvel. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait a minute. So, so that was that's an actual piece so, of evidence from the case? Yeah. So in the case, what DC did is introduce, I think, the first 11 issues of Action Comics as exhibits and an issue of Wonder Man comics, Wonder, Com Wonder Comics, uh, to show how Wonder Man infringed on DC's copyright. So that's why it has the <coughs> exhibit stamps on it. So I own two, three, five, eight, those and are, nine, I think. Somewhere. And those are the only ones in existence with those stamps on it. Yeah, because it's just one one copy that stamp. This is the actual exhibit awesome. from the yeah. court. Now, I will say because DC knows it, these are stolen books. No, really? Okay. Back, Whoa, okay. Wait a back, back that up. I want, I want to hear that yeah, backstory. Hold on a second. How no, are they stolen? Over that mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. We almost blew past that. So let's. Yeah. Let's by the way, they're with... stolen, and uh, there's a murder involved. But let me talk about this other one real quick. <laughs> but, but, Whoa, but hold, hold a on a second. Hold on a second. <laughs> I'm out. So, um, in court cases, right? So when I've handled trials, not many, but I've handled trials. We put in the exhibits, and at the end of the trial, we get the exhibits back. The lawyers get the exhibits back. And so these would have gone back to DC at the time. And at least in the early 70s, we know that they still existed uh, at DC. Um, I'm blanking on his name. Who was the guy uh, who, who produced the uh, Batman movie in 89? 
uh tim burton directed tim burton. Yeah. uh um it was a big comic book guy R- written books about comic books all right now i get up you'll have to do it when you say his name i'll i'll know it because he I'm produced the batman Schuster, is it you're not he, thinking of schumacher are you he, no 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 that's bought, later he bought the rights schumacher. from dc and then and, and for years it took until he was able to do it uh, and you tell me his name, uh, I'll recognize immediately. But as I get older, I blank on names, unfortunately. So he worked as an intern in D.C. I know I have his book somewhere behind me, actually. So I'll, I'll have to look on the shelf. Uh, I got a whole uh, bookcase full. Those are all books about comic books and everything. Um, John Peters? No. Peter Goober? No. You want me to come Sam over there and help you? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you might he, need to. He was tasked to inventory some of uh, the closets and storage facilities that DC had. And these were there at the time. Now, there's also something I didn't bring them down that I collect. I have the largest collection of ash cans. And ash cans have a modern terminology, which is not what they are historically. Ash cans were created um, by a few comic book companies in the 30s, 40s, and 50s to trademark the title of the book. DC did it, Fawcett did it, um, a couple of other companies did it, but mostly DC and Fawcett. They would create a mock comic book with the title Action Comics and either have no content inside or a couple of pages inside or uh, take a remaindered comic from an actual published book, stick it inside, send it in, to the trademark office, trademark the title, copyright protects the story inside, the characters, trademark does the title (coughs) and and the artwork of it. And that way they could, you know, go after anyone who infringed. This is a weird question. Did the Ashcan for Action 2 go on auction like within the past 15 years? Uh, I think I remember seeing that. Action. There, there is, uh, I'm trying to think if it went up. The action number one court copy sold for like $170,000 through Harry. Wow. A little bit too pricey for me, yeah. uh, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and the seven just sold recently. But I feel like I've seen them pop up here and there. The, the, there's, there's an action comics ash can. It has the cover of Detective One. This kind of skull uh, yeah. guy. Uh, I have Action Funnies Action uh, Trade um, Ash Can, which has the cover of Action Number Three on it. And Action Funnies, though, never became a comic. You know, they just trademarked anything wow. they could. I had no idea because I have a bunch of Star Wars Dark Horse Ash Can comics. I just thought it was like a black and white version of the comic. Yeah, somebody kind of stole the idea. Yeah. It, I had no idea. Apparently, it was ash can meant they were going to throw it out. Trash can ash. Yeah, yeah. We we really don't know the history of it because everyone who who made them is dead. Right. <laughs> There's no records on it. But so I have a couple of I don't know two three dozen different ash cans of of Captain Marvel of all the DC uh, different storylines, House of Mystery. Um, Lots of ones that were never made into titles uh, or used into titles either. But so all of that existed at DC when Saul Harrison, who was one of the editors of DC, retired in the mid 80s. Apparently, he took a lot of this stuff with him. Hmm. And as time went by, he sold it off. So we don't know how these got out of DC. I mean, DC knows I own a bunch of them. I, I talked to DC, their lawyers. and Do they ever try to get them back from you? Like, they ever try to sell no, their stolen? No, I mean, there's, there's no real way to know because th- th- these books meant nothing to them back in the 70s and 80s, quite frankly. Yeah. So whether or not someone took them with permission as a gift, stole them, who knows? There's no record of it, yeah. There's no record of it. So they don't know at all. So, um, and I've worked with, with DC and their lawyers on a number of things, helping them out on cases and stuff. So, you know, I, I'm not concerned. That's why I say. That what would that, did. what would that comic go for if you had to sell it right now? Uh, I would probably, I, I would not sell this book for less than 40 grand. 
Holy Whoa. shit. All right, Mark, you and I will have a conversation at the end of the show. Yeah. I mean, this is the <laughs> second appearance of Superman. It, yeah. It's a restored copy. Yeah, yeah. Slightly restored. But just the story behind it, though, makes it even more worth value. Sure. It's it's so appealing. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. It, so adds, Lauren, it adds to the appeal of the book. Lauren mentioned Fawcett. So Fawcett was a huge comic book publisher, but it was mostly an, an educational publisher, book publisher, and then came into comic books in the early 40s. And uh, so they published Captain Marvel, right, starting in 1940. This is Wiz Comics 85 from 1947. Uh, when Captain Marvel came out in 1940, it was very clearly a close, if not infringement of Superman. Mm -hmm. And DC Comics sued Fawcett in 1941. World War II started, so the case did not go to trial until 1947. Uh, and in, I'm sorry, 1948 did not go to trial. Uh, and when they had uh, their trial, um, Fawcett actually won on a legal technicality uh, because DC uh, didn't properly copyright the newspaper version of Superman. And so they were able to say it fell into the public domain. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals, so this is the Southern District of New York, uh, Manhattan, um, Second Circuit reversed. And then by 1954, superheroes had fallen out of favor. So Fawcett got out of comic books completely and sold and settled the case for $400,000 to DC, which is, uh, I don't know, a couple, a few million dollars in today's money. Uh, Where oh, DC, DC kind of messed up because they didn't put the copyright on the Captain Marvel name. It went to public domain afterwards. Yes. And so, that's when right. Marvel came in and was like, ours wow yeah. no Good. way history. that's why so ultimately dc bought captain marvel but because of what lauren just explained captain marvel from marvel comics in 1968 if i have my 68 69 yeah I'm it right. was 68 68 uh when shazam came out in 73 i think that is because they DC lost Captain Marvel to Marvel from a huh. copyright standpoint. Mm. Yep. So this is another exhibit copy. So one of a kind. Uh, this is plaintiff's exhibit number eight. Huh. Uh, F F F F F. Um, there are about. There's only one of every issue that's an exhibit. So DC entered this book into evidence to show that Captain Marvel was infringing on Superman's copyright. And there are about, hard to say, um, maybe about 20, 20, 25 issues of Captain Marvel Adventures, Wiz Comics that are exhibit stamps. We don't have, I mean, actually, I, I can go through the record of the trial. I have a lot of the records from the trial. I could probably figure, I actually have a book that I'm part of that's coming out in next month, uh, Empire of Superheroes, uh, oh. that I helped with. Uh, oh, that cool. Through a lot of the court case uh, and how the industry has developed over the decades. Uh, but really litigation, the lecture I give at law schools is about how litigation has influenced superheroes it is i mean if anything has killed superheroes it's not only the fact that they might not sell but it's also that they were destroyed in court because wow. of legal battles mm. so these books um were apparently i guess dc didn't care about them because these would have gone back to dc but many of these were found in Fawcett's warehouse when Fawcett sold off its warehouse collection in 83, 84, uh, Sparkle City Comics, which is still exists in name now, uh, they're a big eBay seller, but it's a different person. They bought the name. Sparkle City Comics was a big comic book company in the early 80s. And the big people like Steve Jeppe and Sparkle City bought out Fawcett's warehouse when Fawcett just cleared everything out. And a lot of the ash cans that I, the faucet ash cans and these trial exhibits were found in the warehouse and wow. sold. 
And these again, I mean, this is, it's a $500 book. It's, you know, it's not significantly expensive. Um, I mean, as a whiz 85, 70, it's not, it's a nothing book. Right. Uh, but the fact that, it, you know, one of a kind court copy is what. what what's probably like the most in, in, uh, intriguing comic court case you've ever had, you've ever come across? Like what stands out if you had to pick one? Like what's one of the most famous or most controversial or. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, those two DC cases are the most, I'd say the most sort of famous ones. Mm -hmm. And the Captain Marvel is probably the, the most interesting because it really is the battles of superheroes. Oh, yeah. Against each other. I mean, people don't remember. Well, our, most people who are alive today wouldn't remember that Captain Marvel outsold Superman in the early 40s when, when, it first, when he first came out. And if you read Captain Marvel today, it's, it, they're, they're really stupid stories. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, they're, they're really campy. I taught yeah. my girlfriend the, this word. So she's not a comic book person. I bring her to the comic book shows. And she never had heard this word campy before. Campy. Yeah, yeah. How, and, all right. How old is your girlfriend? She's forty. Yeah, yeah. She's never heard camping. She never heard of camping. So, so let me ask you: Did she? But does she enjoy herself when you guys go to the show? I ask this legitimately because I know my wife would rather bleed from the eyes than go to a convention. She loves it. I bring her up to Baltimore Comic Con every year when it's there. And last year we dressed up as Iron Man and Pepper Potts. Oh, that's so cool! That's awesome. Oh, you have to show us a picture. You yeah. have to show us a picture. Oh, yeah. I have to look for it. I'll look for it. <laughs> That's but pretty cool. That's awesome. Court cases. Um, I mean, there were some major lawyers, top-notch lawyers, who were on this court case. It was it was a lot of money that was involved. Wow. You know, back in this time frame, uh, I actually have. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Doug Braithwaite is. Mm -mm. The He's name is familiar. Artist. Yes, and he um, he did a lot of work with. Uh, Oh my God! Who's the um, the color? He's the artist. The color, uh, one of the top colorists. Oh, I, For DC. I, yeah, I'm 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 embarrassed that I'm not remembering this name because if I said the name, you would go, yeah, because he's like a name that is known, but I'm just blanking on it. Anyway, I did some work for him, so I had him create uh, an original. It's probably about. Yay, bigger than this, bigger than she can't even see on the screen of Captain Marvel battling Superman uh, that I was going to use for like the cover of a book because one day I want to do a book on the on the lawsuit. Um, but as far what I have found also over the years is I have found comic books that were used in court cases and I have no idea what these court cases were. So. For example, I found a, I have a 1950s horror book, early 50s EC book that was used as an exhibit in some sort of criminal case in the 1970s. Mm. You know, it has the court sticker on it. Wow. And, and, like and, the criminal was like copying a, like a scene I, from the comic book? You know, I, I'm going to, the only thing I can guess, because it, it's, too far back to find online as a record. Yeah. So I, I'm going to have to call the court in California and figure out. I'm, I'm going to guess that either somebody stole the book from somebody's house and it became an exhibit in, in the court case, yeah. or hey, maybe he murdered somebody with the comic book and that was the murder <laughs> weapon or something. I don't yeah. know. Rolled it up and stuffed it in their <laughs> mouth or something. <laughs> but uh, I have a Captain America 25 uh, ish. So that's probably 19. 40 yeah that's 40, old. 42 or 43 that was used in uh, a court case i think by joe simon when he sued timely or marvel at some point but i it, it's one there's a lot of court cases that people don't know about um so speaking on that because you said timely so triggered it mlj which eventually became archie comics successfully almost sued timely because of their use of uh the shield so Captain America's shield was supposedly copying the shield's costume from MLJ Comics. So I think all it was was just a simple cease and desist and Tylee was like, sorry. 
So that's actually why Captain America has a round shield instead of the tripoint because yeah. of Archie. Wow. That's pretty, there, that's, that's fascinating. There's a lot of that. I mean, especially in the early 20th centuries, if you name like the, the major character, Betty Boop, um, uh, Buster Brown, there's all litigation about all of these characters. That's crazy. In the early 20th century. I mean, some, a lot of these characters, frankly, aren't known today, which is really sad. Uh, yeah. Except the diehards like us. Um, and now there's a lot more litigation because uh, just, you know, everybody's litigation happy. Uh, but but in the 40s and 50s, there were lawsuits, you know, by major companies to really sh in the early days of the industry to shut down any type of copying because that was that could be death for the company yeah. uh, at the time. And, you know, this is all out of New York City because that's where everybody was located. And all these people worked for one another all the time. Uh, you know, they, they were former employees, they broke off, they literally, the, this guy Fox was in, as I said, the same building as DC, he like rented an office downstairs or upstairs in the same building, created, Will Eisner worked for him, Will Eisner testified and lied, uh, committed perjury. Really? No in, way. Uh, wow. you know, not well known, because Will Eisner is a very positive image the way you're right the yeah. rewards and everything but yeah he he's, he's, an, he's an icon in our industry he, he, made, he completely lied in the court case uh huh. because he was they, they basically they he was told to copy superman just blatantly copy superman and he lied about that no no we came up with this on our own and they told him wow hmm and then, so was Captain Marvel, Captain Marvel at DC? Was that the actual name at DC, named Captain Marvel? No, no. So he was Fawcett when he created Captain Marvel. And it's great in the court case. What, you know, what were the differences? Fawcett argued, well, Captain Marvel is really a teenage boy named Billy Batson in the daytime. All right. He has to say the words Shazam to turn into Captain Marvel. Superman is Clark Kent. He's an adult turning into an adult superhero. Um, Billy Batson and Captain Marvel, you know, have enemies that are animals, which Superman does not. Mm. Uh, I mean, it was it was really kind of. Wow. I mean, you could also argue that Clark Kent can also use Superman's powers, whereas right. Billy Batson yeah, cannot. He has to say Shazam. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I don't know. I thought that was a frivolous lawsuit because I, I I personally think it was just DC being jealous that Fawcett was making more money at the time. Yeah, I mean, a good amount more money. Yeah. Wow. So we, so, we, so we had to pick one, Mark, DC or Marvel? You know, that's a good question. Harris uh, Comics. MLJ. Oh. <laughs> I, I will say when... Nope. DC, Marvel. When I... A&M. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when I was a uh, junior high school and I had subscriptions to comic books... You know, they would show up literally in the mail, you know, folded over, unfortunately, yep. with subscription. In the, in the brown, in the brown paper. In the brown paper. Sleeve. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. All, I think all my subscriptions were Marvel. Uh, so uh, Spider-Man, FF. Uh, I was always a Captain America fan, but, uh, uh, and Spider-Man. Uh, like Sp Spider-Man, FF, Captain America were the primary ones. Uh, but I was always uh, a, a Superman fan for sure. Uh, is that your top? Is that your top superhero? If you had to pick one, the Superman. Uh, yeah, you know, hard to say. I'm not sure if I have a top. Yeah. Person. I mean, from mm -hmm. Marvel uh, or from D. I'm sorry, from DC, Superman. From Marvel, probably be Spider-Man or Captain America. Yeah. Yeah. So if you had access to the vault, you'd dress up as Captain America. Grab Chris Evans. Oh, that outfit. would be awesome. Oh yeah. If I, <laughs> if, but I would need like the a really good cop like i would not want to dress up he's in the most stupid <laughs> captain america yeah, yeah. It, it would have to be like a could, really good captain america i could yeah. see that you kind of had the image of a captain america man i can i can see that yep you can slick the hair back a little bit yep i can see that hmm. maybe uh, makes put some extra muscles on the yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 chris evans had and everything or i guess maybe now it's all cgi i don't know oh i'm pretty so, sure it is chris evans <laughs> So I, I think I think this Get might out the topless photos. Yeah, <laughs> dude, a f funny story that right. I remember when I did a private signing with Chris Evans last year, and we had a shit ton of stuff laid out for him. And the one photo, and I have to find the photo and bring it up and show you guys. It's pretty hilarious. 
and uh it was it was him with that shirt off and this girl she just wanted him to sign across his chest you know love you know her name uh and then you know and then just and he looked at it and he just laughed and everybody was just like you know they just loved it man it was so funny Let's see if i can find it real quick but uh yeah it was pretty funny it was the only one that had his shirt off every other one was like a comic or a poster or, or something but he got a kick out of that one though that's pretty that was pretty funny if i can find my uh, well, artwork of well let's see if you might be able to see this a little bit enough you know there's the oh what's that the superman captain marvel original artwork i had done that's awesome who's the artist i, I absolutely that's love Doug that Braithwaite. Oh wow! A British uh, comic book writer. I, art- I love that like weird wa- rivalry. Um, so, Mark, <laughs> I assume you've seen Lauren. Do you see that? The what? There's the. Here, let me I can't, all I see is Mark. Oh. Oh. Okay. It's not, it's not, let me try to focus it in. Hold on a second. <laughs> Chris Evans is so pretty. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Go. Yep, that's what he wanted. That's what she wanted. Sign right across. The oh chest my gosh. And- Honestly, same. We all got somebody. We all gotta somebody went to the man. gym. Somebody so, went to the gym. Speaking of Shazam, Superman, um, I got a big kick out of it because I'm a history nerd and I love the the like rivalry between Shazam and Superman. At the end of the Shazam movie, Superman shows up, and I personally got a kick out of it because it's like, haha, you can't be Captain Marvel anymore because of that guy. Yep. Um, most of my other friends are like, no, that's really fucking nerdy. And I'm not going to laugh at that joke, but I figured all of you might appreciate. Oh, that was, yeah, that was awesome. I love them. That happened. There's a lot of awesome inside humor with stuff like that. Well, in, um, history. in one of the animated uh, Shazam movies, Billy Batson goes to Fawcett high school, which to me was the biggest fuck you that DC could have possibly done because they kind of helped put them out of business. Buy it. They bought, I mean, the, they didn't get the right from the the, the lawsuit settlement. They bought right. it years later. But by that time, it was too late for the... Yeah. I mean, it's a shame, but yeah, whatever. Yeah. The other thing I'll do is I, I will get... Um, I collect a lot of animation art also. I mean, you know, like you see some of the, some stuff in the background, uh, some of the stuff you can't see. But, you have some cells. Uh, hmm? You have some cells? Oh, I'll be right back. But, but I have... Oh. So I, I had... Uh, this bounce. done by a Disney artist named Patrick Block, um, and so this is an original commissioned uh, Disney piece. So they're in like a Revolutionary War courtroom. Oh yeah, look at that! That's awesome. Oh. And everything. Uh, and then I had a. Let me see if I have it where I can put. Uh, you know, I don't think I have it up in this one, unfortunately. But I I had a Hanna Barbera artist. Uh, do a complete courtroom scene where I'm the lawyer and all the Hanna-Barbera characters are the ju- the Fred Flintstone is the yeah, judge. Yeah. <laughs> the Flintstone oh, that's the awesome. The jury is Tom and Jerry and, and everything like that. Uh, oh, that's brilliant. Really that's cool freaking awesome. Um, and I kind of have all these, uh, these are all uh, lawyer uh, cells, animated cells. cells, you know, mostly uh, Looney Tunes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Are those hanging in your house? Yeah, those they're in the the basement. That's awesome. And like Disney animation art. Oh yeah. No white. That's little uh, um, Little Mermaid, right? What? I see Little Mermaid on little top. Little Mermaid right? on the top. Snow White, uh, two in the middle, and yeah. uh, Lady and the Tramp at the bottom. Oh my gosh! Set to tell. Lauren's Lauren's gonna be cool. very upset that she missed that particular moment because she's <laughs> very, very Disney. Very Disney. What so what what's probably your all time favorite um law type style movie? I'll tell you uh, mine and then after you're done, you tell me how good it is compared to your list. You know, if if you wanna talk about it, like a real movie, you know, to kill a mockingbird. Yes, yes. yes. That's what I was gonna say. Uh, oh my gosh, yes. And, and, I mean, you know, I, I collect yes. a lot of the first editions of the book. I have a lot of movie posters in different Mark, lines. did you ever have an opportunity to meet Harper Lee? I have to ask. No, uh, no, but I have a friend of mine worked for her. Uh, okay, I never met her, unfortunately. Um, but certainly that I think I could probably even show you guys. I have a uh, a huge. I collect 
movie posters of law related films, superhero films, um, spy films, because I represent spies as, as a lawyer. Um, and I could probably show you a, some, so you can kind of see, uh, this is my, my living room. So you can see the top of To Kill a Mockingbird. Yep, yep. Cool.